The wars which engulfed the Napoleonic Age were monumental affairs involving the mobilization of millions of men from across Europe. Such titanic struggles are often analyzed from the bird's eye perspective of the armchair general. But in this series, we shall descend to the ground level to experience the history of the common soldier. From the process of conscription to individual and units level training, the chaos of battle and beyond. This is the story of a soldier's life in Napoleon's Grand Armée. You can join your own cause with today's sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. It's a free-to-play 4X MMO game where you have the con to explore the Star Trek universe. As a Starbase commander, you will first need a ship. Build mighty vessels including the USS Enterprise, Romulan Warbird, and Klingon Bird of Prey. Then staff a crew of your choosing with their own unique stats and buffs. Recruit iconic characters like Kirk, Spock, Geordi, and more as you prepare to go where no one has gone before. Missions take you across the Star Trek universe with the new Kelvin timeline offering players a fresh narrative to engage with. You can also join alliances and clash with players in epic battles for a more competitive experience. Star Trek Fleet Command is available for free on mobile and desktop. Gameplay is always evolving with tons of new experiences, in-game contests, and giveaways. So download it now using my link below or scan the QR code to join the fight. New players can also use our promo code WARPSPEED to grab 10 epic shards of Kirk. To make it easy, we've listed the instructions in the description below. Enjoy! I also wanted to give a huge shout out to the 21st Regiment d'Infanterie for their awesome reenactment work. They've got their own fledgling social media channel which I'll link below. Check them out. And with that, back to Guy Michaels. Before we throw ourselves into the midst of battle, we will have to rewind the clock to see how soldiers came to find themselves in the ranks of the army in the first place. To do so, we will focus our first episode on the recruitment and training of new soldiers. Let us begin. From the formation of the First Coalition in 1792 to Napoleon's final downfall at Waterloo in 1815, France fought most of Europe for the better part of two decades. From the hills of Portugal to the depths of Russia and colonial theatres across the seas. Satisfying the war's vast appetite for manpower became the central issue for Napoleon's empire, and failure to resolve it led to its ultimate collapse. As such, we will now discuss the process by which soldiers were recruited. Since the storming of the Bastille, the various revolutionary governments had relied largely on volunteers to fill its ranks. However, following a string of defeats, the French Royal Army moved to institute a series of emergency mass conscriptions, culminating in the Levée en masse of 1793. Starting with a quota for the nation to raise 300,000 soldiers, it was a bold move meant to pull France from the brink of defeat. The decree read as follows, quote, From this moment until such time as its enemies shall have been driven from the soil of the Republic, all Frenchmen are in permanent requisition for the services of the armies. The young men shall fight, the married men shall forge arms and transport provisions, the women shall make tents and clothes and shall serve in the hospitals. The children shall turn old linen into lint, the old men shall betake themselves to the public squares in order to arouse the courage of the warriors and preach hatred of kings and the unity of the Republic. This revolutionary spirit and the swelling nationalism of the common people had now unlocked a vast pool of manpower unrivaled by many of its contemporaries. Over the course of the Revolutionary Wars, perhaps a million men fought for France, allowing it not only to defend itself, but take the offensive against a growing coalition of hostile neighbours. But even these vast forces dwindled in time. Thus, it was necessary to establish a more permanent system to maintain French armies. This was done in 1798, when a military commission passed the Jourdan Law, 
which established the legal basis of recruitment. Once more, it highlighted the war footing of the nation, with Article 1 stating that, quote, Every Frenchman is a soldier and must defend the country. Shortly after, Article 3 lays out the broad terms of the reform, quote, Outside of the case of the danger to the country, the army is formed from voluntary enrollment and by way of military conscription. We will now take a look at both volunteer and conscripted service, beginning with the former. According to the law, men aged 18 to 30 could enlist voluntarily for a term of four years in peacetime. Some exceptions were made for younger volunteers. For instance, the children of soldiers could enlist at the age of 16. In 1806, Napoleon extended this exception to civilian 16-year-olds who had their parents' permission. According to the law, all such volunteers would need to present a certificate of good conduct signed by the mayor of their municipality and the justice of the peace. Their enrollment would then be registered in a town hall where records would be taken of the citizen's identity, residence and physical description. As an incentive for such volunteers to come forward, they were paid more than conscripts, with this bonus gradually increasing the longer they served. However, despite such incentives and the lofty rhetoric of the law, volunteers were not enough to meet the manpower needs of the French army, which, during the Napoleonic Wars, consisted mostly of conscripts. Let us now turn to this practice. Officially, the law subjected men aged 20 to 25 to conscription, dividing them into five age classes. Local authorities were ordered to maintain lists of all such men in their district. Information included the names, professions and residences of all men of suitable age. When the call from up high came for conscription, it would involve a quota of men which must be raised from the various territorial regions known as cantons. Each cantonal authority would then consult its list of eligible men and select conscripts by lottery. Each man would have a number randomly drawn, ranging from one to the total number of eligible candidates. Those whose number was below or equal to the required quota were selected. Next, they would face a council to determine their fitness to serve. This recruitment council was headed by the department prefect. Alongside him was the senior military officer of the department and a major from the Ministry of War. A captain from one of the regiments, slated to receive the new draft, advised the council but could not vote. This council screened men based on various criteria. Generally speaking, conscripts had to be in good health and stand at least 1.488 meters tall. A host of other exemptions existed, including men whose brothers had already been killed, single fathers with children to care for, and men already registered for conscription into the Navy. Men lacking sight in the right eye, front teeth necessary to tear open paper cartridges, or the right thumb or index finger were exempt from service. Loss of a whole left hand or other limb also disqualified potential conscripts. As a result, self-mutilation was a common means of draft evasion. Should they be discovered, these men would be punished with five years of hard labor. Those who had come by their infirmities honestly, or at least remained undetected, had to pay a 50 franc indemnity the rough equivalent of five months' wages for a soldier. However, another method of recruitment occurred in the form of substitution, whereby a conscript might hire another to take his place. While initially a somewhat informal practice, this actually became legalized in 1800. However, not just anyone could become a substitute. They had to be in good health, stand at least 1.651 meters tall, and not themselves be a potential conscript. 
As the wars of the empire proved increasingly deadly, the demand for substitutional service skyrocketed. Not only would draft dodging conscripts have to pay the 100 francs for their substitute's uniform, but they would also pay them a sign-on fee many times a soldier's annual wage. Sadly, this often meant that it was the poorest and most desperate who took the place in Napoleon's front lines. Yet even the system put in place by the Jordan law could not keep up with the meat grinder of the empire's wars. As such, the French government increasingly began to stretch the age limits of conscription beyond the initial 20 to 25 year range, while also forbidding men from leaving the ranks regardless of how long they had already served. In this way, roughly one and a half million men were mobilized to fight for an empire which ultimately came to gobble up much of Europe and directly rule over 44 million people. The vast majority of these troops who fought under the Eagles did so in the infantry, and so it shall be they whom we focus on as we explore the life of a Napoleonic soldier. We can begin with a soldier who has just passed the inspection of the Conscription Council. He will now be assigned a date to gather in the departmental capital and depart for their assigned regimental depots under armed escort. As can be imagined, these departures were emotional scenes. Philippe Gill, a conscript of 1808, recounts the following in his memoirs. Quote, I left Paris by the St. Martin Gate. Arriving at Bourget, we had lunch, and as we left this village, I asked my brother and those of my friends who accompanied me not to go any further. This child remained as if petrified in the middle of the road, his two arms outstretched towards me, and though I was already very far away, he had not changed his stance. However, when I lost sight of him, tears finally came, and after having given this last tribute to tenderness, I caught up with my travelling companions and continued on my way. For many, such an experience was too much to bear, and desertion was common. This was often the case among peasant farmer families who relied on young men to work the land. Desertion was especially rife in southern France, which was generally poorer and more skeptical of the revolution and empire than the north and east. As the wars increasingly turned against France, the empire relied on harsher measures to combat draft evasion and desertion. Columns of gendarmes prowled the country, searching for deserters. One of their measures was to quarter soldiers in the deserters' home, preventing them from returning and putting further financial pressure on their families. But for all recruits who did not dodge service, their next step towards the front was an assigned mustering point. Often, this would have been an army depot. Here, the men would join their officers and the rest of their unit. This union would have been formalized when conscripts took the oath of soldiers in the French army which went as follows. Quote, I swear obedience to the constitution of the empire and fidelity to the emperor. With this pronouncement, they would then be entered into their regiment's administrative registers. Thus began life in Napoleon's army. As soldiers, they would now receive their equipment, including weapons and uniforms. In emergency situations, these green troops would be rushed into battle. Ideally, however, they would have several weeks or months at the depot before being deployed. This precious time would have been dedicated to training. We shall cover it now. Following Napoleon's 1808 decree reorganizing the French infantry, the depot was organized as a battalion of four companies with a small headquarters led by a major. The four companies had different functions. The fourth saw to the initial equipment and training of the new conscripts. The first and third would march the conscripts to and convalescence back from the war battalions. And the second would see to garrison duties in France. Training in the depot was organized into a series of schools. At the most basic level was the School of the Soldier, 
in which the conscripts learned from a more experienced soldier how to stand, how to march, how to hold his weapon, and so on. Next came the School of the Platoon, which taught the conscripts how to move and fight as part of a unit. Formation drill was critical to a soldier's survival on the battlefields of the Empire. Troops caught out of formation or in the wrong formation for facing the wrong way were vulnerable to enemies massed in good order, particularly cavalry. The School of the Platoon taught soldiers how to march in formation, how to file march to one side or the other, how to change direction by wheeling, how to move from line to column, and vice versa. The School of the Platoon also taught giving fire by command as a whole platoon and fire by two ranks, in which the first two ranks fired at will and the third rank passed loaded muskets forward to the second, receiving empty muskets to reload. French tactics of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars prized aimed musket fire, so when stocks of powder and shot allowed, the depots incorporated target practice into the conscripts' training regimen. This often took the form of shooting competitions in which the best shots could win cash prizes. Target practice began at nearly 100 meters and was repeated at 200 and 300 meters. Soldiers would then comb the fields for the spent balls so they could be remolded. Once they had been sufficiently trained, or the need at the front became sufficiently dire, the depot companies of different regiments would assemble into march battalions to depart for the war battalions to which they were assigned. At the end of their daily marches, the training continued as they honed their drill in the school of the battalion. The battalion was the main tactical unit during the Napoleonic Wars, so these were important maneuvers. Changing front, forming battalion lines, squares, columns of divisions, and transitioning from different formations to each other were some of the most important. This was the beginning of a long trek across Europe to the embattled frontiers of the empire. Alas, it was a trek many would not survive, and from which even fewer ever returned. Join us in our next episode as we cover life in Napoleon's army, and be sure to check out the amazing work of the 21st, who've done a fantastic job bringing the past to life. Consider becoming a member of the channel or our Patreon to catch script previews, behind-the-scenes content, and polls. A big thanks to the members for supporting the channel, as well as the researchers, writers, and artists for making this episode possible. We couldn't have done it without this team and this community. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like and subscribe for more content and check out these other related videos. See you in the next one.